This is the inaugural symposium on evolutionary consumption. Hopefully we'll have others in the future. For those of you who don't know what that means, uh, evolutionary consumption is basically the application of evolutionary principles to study our consumatory nature. Uh, my name is Gad Saad. I'm a professor here at uh, Concordia University, housed in the John Mosel School of Business. Maybe I could tell you a bit about the speaker so that we don't have to introduce them as they come up to speak. Um, so you know who I am. Doug Kenrick is certainly one of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, and he has spawned, so to speak, the next generation of evolutionary psychologists, who some of some of whom have been housed uh, or are housed in business schools. Uh, we have Tripad Gill, who is uh, my first doctoral student who I was able to convince to come and join the Darwin train. Uh, he's now a, a, a chaired professor at uh, Loria University. He holds a Canada research chair. So very proud of his accomplishments. Uh, we then have after lunch, we have three speakers in the morning, then we take a 45 minute lunch break. Then we have Marty Hazelton, who's a professor at UCLA and was the editor in chief of the premier journal in the field, Evolution and Human Behavior. Uh, her former supervisor was uh, also supposed to be here, but unfortunately he's got some um, family constraints that didn't allow him to be here. This is David Buss from University of Texas, Austin. And then we have a, a local rising star, Daniel Snitzer. Uh, he's a professor, assistant professor of psychology at University of Montreal. Uh, he was trained by two of the early pioneers and most influential pioneers of evolutionary psychology, the husband and wife team of John Tooby and Lita Cosmides at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And then we have Tobias Otterbring, who's the one who's coming from the furthest away. Marty's coming from California, which is pretty far, but I think in terms of how the crow flies, he's coming from Denmark, from Aarhus University. Uh, and he is the uh, uh, editor of a special issue to be published in the Journal of Business Research on the intersection of evolutionary psychology and biology in, in business research. And so this symposium is affiliated to that special issue. And then finally, certainly last but not least, we have Jeffrey Miller, who was one of the very, very early folks to recognize uh, how we might apply evolutionary psychology in various domains, and certainly in the context of consumer behavior. He's a professor at University of New Mexico. And uh, there you have it. So I think what I'll do is just start off uh, with my lecture. Uh, I only picked my lecture. I mean, I didn't know how to choose the order of the various people. Uh, I tried to pick a mix of sort of senior people and more junior people across before lunch and after lunch. Uh, I chose to put myself first only because I'm offering a, if you'd like, a broad overview of some of the epistemological, theoretical, conceptual benefits of Darwinizing consumer research, but more generally actually Darwinizing the behavioral sciences. And that's the only reason I'm going first. Hopefully all the other talks will only get better as the day goes on. So. So the, the title of my talk is The Benefits of Darwinizing Consumer Research. By the way, we each have about 30 minutes to speak, and then I'll be open it up for the audience. And for the speakers, please hold the microphones because we're taping this whole event to then be posted on my channel. So hopefully many, many people will watch it. And sorry for this technical information. You could move from here all the way to here if you want to be within the camera shot. So there you go. All right. So here we go. You know, probably every single evolutionary psychologist can tell you a story about their epiphany, their moment when they were bitten by the evolutionary bug. Uh, and so I thought that I would share mine. Maybe some young student in the audience will one day argue that today's event was their epiphany. As a matter of fact, I once spoke at University of New Mexico. Jeffrey had invited me to speak there. And one of the students who was in the audience ended up then coming to Montreal to study under my tutelage, and then he completed a PhD. He did a master's with me, and then he did his PhD at McGill. My epiphany happened in my first semester as a doctoral student. I can't believe it's now 1990. Uh, some of the people in this room were not born then. 
it's a, it's a scary thought. Um, it was my first semester as a doctoral student at Cornell, and my doctoral supervisor, who's a mathematical and cognitive psychologist, not an evolutionary psychologist, suggested that I take a course with Professor Dennis Regan, who's a social psychologist. And so about halfway through the course, this was not an evolutionary psychology course, it was a social psychology course. Half, about halfway through the course, he assigned a book titled Homicide, which is written by two of the other pioneers of evolutionary psychology, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson. And if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend that you do. What they basically do in the book is they demonstrate how to apply uh, evolutionary thinking and understanding patterns of criminality. And so I thought that the, the explanatory power of evolutionary psychology was so powerful, I wanted to study consumer decision making, psychology decision making, and so that's where I had sort of the epiphany to then go out and try to Darwinize consumer behavior. So I'm forever indebted to Dennis Regan. So what I thought I'd do, of course the, the speakers who are here will know some of this stuff, but the, some of the other audience members may not. Um, so I published a paper in 2017 in the journal Marketing Research where I explain the epistemology, the, the method of EP, but not method in the sense of using surveys or, or experiments or content analysis, the epistemological method. How do you do evolutionary science? And so what I thought I would do for my lecture is to discuss this and then show you the benefits that are then reaped uh, in incorporating an evolutionary lens. So the first thing you want to understand when it comes to evolutionary psychology or evolutionary sciences in general is the difference between proximate and ultimate explanations, which I'll talk about each of these in turn, and then how do you build nomological networks of cumulative evidence, and then the fact that evolutionary theory allows you to build consilient trees of knowledge. Consilience is a term that was reintroduced into our lexicon by E.O. Wilson. Consilience refers to unity of knowledge, and so it creates if you'd like, epistemological coherence when you have the evolutionary lens. So let's start with proximate versus ultimate, for those of you who don't know what that is. Much of science operates at the proximate level. This is the how and what of a phenomenon. Most Nobel Prizes are won at the proximate level. There's nothing wrong with that. That's where science operates. The ultimate level exp tries to address the Darwinian why. Why would a phenomenon be of that form. So it's not that ultimate is superior to proximate. It's not ultimate in that uh, hierarchical sense. It's ultimate in that if you unfold the causal explanation, it's the sort of final Darwinian why. The classic example I like to use to make that point is pregnancy sickness. Right? So pregnancy sickness occurs in very predictable ways to women around the world. There are endless number of proximate questions we could ask. How do uh, shifts in hormonal levels affect the severity of a woman's symptoms? Okay, that's, that's a fine proximate question. The ultimate question is why would that mechanism have evolved to be of that form? And the answer is that it happens, it solves an adaptive problem. It happens during a period called organogenesis, during the first trimester, where it is particularly important that the forming utero uh, embryo is uh, fetus is not being exposed to teratogens, dangerous, uh, uh, for example, food pathogens that might wreak havoc to the development of the organs. Therefore, women evolve certain disdain for foods or other sources. Uh, they're attracted to others, pickling, pickles, that serves an antimicrobial property. And so the types of food that you're attracted to or repulsed by, uh, the fact that you feel nauseous, the fact that you throw up, are all mechanisms that help solve an adaptive problem. Women who uh, suffer more greatly, I mean more so from pregnancy sickness, are, more, are less likely to have a miscarriage. The health outcomes are, are likely better when you go all the way to childbearing. And so there are very clear evolutionary reasons why that mechanism exists. So again, this doesn't falsify anything that we've covered at the proximate level. It simply adds an epistemological level, layered explanation to the phenomenon at hand. And of course, in consumer behavior, we could do the same thing. If we want to study conspicuous consumption, there are a million great proximate questions we could ask. 
are there personality trait differences that might help us why someone is a conspicuous consumer or not? That's a proximate question. But then the ultimate question might be, well, why have we evolved the desire, the pension to engage in conspicuous consumption? And it's related to sexual signaling. So again, one does not uh, outdo the other. So the next thing that I'd like to do is spend a bit of time explaining how we build these nomological networks of cumulative evidence. So if you think back of Charles Darwin, what makes his original book in 1859 so remarkable is that he collected data assiduously stemming from many, many different sources. So it's not as though he only collected data uh, that's, uh, you know, that the paleontologist would collect or animal husbandry uh, or biodiversity. He, he collected data from many, many different sources, which when you all put it together, it makes it incontestable that uh, he was onto something veridical. And he didn't have the term nomological networks, but this is now what we call this. And I was, when I was trying to convince my uh, consumer psychologist colleagues and my social science colleagues of the validity of incorporating evolutionary theory in the consumer behavior, I was exactly doing this process without knowing that it had a name. But now we can formalize it. And so what I'll do next is show you two examples of how we can build a biological-based argument or an argument for an adaptation using these nomological networks. So the first example is very much tied to consumer behavior. Well. Uh, are toy preferences learned or are they innate? The reason why I picked this example is, well, first, toy preferences is very much within the purview of consumer behavior. But secondly, it's because social constructivists often use it as sort of the, the, the classic place where, you know, uh, gender roles, uh, trajectories are formed, right? Little Johnny is taught to play aggressively with the blue truck. Uh, little Linda is taught to play gently with the pink doll, and that starts off a cascade of gender role specialization. And of course, that comes from the premise, the tabula rasa premise, we're all born with empty minds, and it's only socialization that makes us who we are. Now, of course, evolutionary psychologists don't reject the idea that socialization is important, right? But socialization typically occurs in particular forms because of biology, not instead of biology. So in this case, this company wanted to sort of reverse the, quote, traditional sex-specific preferences. So now if I wanted to build an argument to prove to you that there is clearly a biological signature to toy preferences, how would I go about doing that? And so this is, so here's the, here's the thing that I'm trying to explain, the biological roots of toy preferences. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build you this nomological network of cumulative evidence stemming from many different fields, many different time periods, many different paradigms, uh, many different cultures, all of which, when put together, makes the evidence seem quite unassailable. So let me go through these. I'll do two of these examples. So for example, you could take children who are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development. In other words, by definition, they're not yet uh, old enough to be socialized, and you could show that the sex specificity of their toy preferences already exist. So that already seems like a pretty uh, death blow to the idea that it's all due to social construction. So if, if I stop the nomological network here, I would already be on pretty solid grounds, but I'm going to go much further. You could take morphological data where you look at the digit ratio, which is a, uh, the, if, typically the 2D, 4D is the uh, ratio of your index finger to your ring finger. It's a sexually dimorphic trait. Men or boys have longer index, uh, uh, ring fingers than index fingers. It is correlated to how much uh, testosterone you've been exposed to in utero. Well, boys, little boys, who have more mas masculinized digit ratios are more likely to have masculinized play behaviors, masculine toy, toy preferences. Okay? So that already is also seemingly pretty convincing evidence. If that doesn't convince you, so here we've got developmental psychology data, morphological data. Now I'm going to give you pediatric endocrinology data where we take the testosterone levels of infant boys and girls starting from seven days old to six months and 
we demonstrate that their levels of circulating testosterone is correlated to their toy preferences. So again, if I stopped here, this is looking pretty good, that there certainly is a biological signature to our toy preferences, but we won't stop there. We could do comparative psychology data. We could look at other animals. We could look at vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys and chimps and show that they exhibit the same sex specificity as do humans. We could look at cross-cultural data from cultures that are fully removed from sort of the Western reality. And this gentleman, this French anthropologist, Rossi, looked at a bewildering number of cultures, and they exhibit the same spec sex specificity of toy preferences. We could look at antiquity and look, look at, do a content analysis of funerary monuments these are mausoleums, and show that the depictions of children playing in mausoleums have the exact same sex specificity. We could look at cross-cultural data from Sweden. Now, why is Sweden chosen? Tobias is originally from Sweden. Sweden scores the highest on Hofstede's femininity scale. In other words, it's the country that has the greatest gender neutrality between the sexes, because they've gone through a social experiment for the past 40 and 50 years to try to eradicate supposed arbitrary gender norms. So that's the perfect country to see whether the 40, 50 year experiment would result in a altering of little boys and little girls toy preferences. And what do you get when you inventory 40 plus thousand Toys. This is not running a study at Ohio State with 22 people and concluding something. This is collecting 40,000 pieces of data. You get the exact same toy preferences in Sweden. And finally, this is from medicine, from clinical endocrinology. Little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an endocrinological disorder that masculinizes them. Girls who suffer from that disorder have Toy, behavior, toy preferences that are more akin to boys. So it's not as though I only used one data source. I used data sources from bewilderingly different fields, all of which point to the same piece of evidence. So this is really a different way of thinking. This is not a literature review. This is not a meta-analysis. It's a way of thinking that says, how could I collect data from as many possible sources as, uh, that I can find so that hopefully it all converges to the same conclusion. Let me give another example. Uh, this is, by the way, a recent study that came out that I hadn't included. New research has found robust sex differences in boys and girls store preferences across a range of ages, time periods, countries, and settings. Let's go on to the next uh, example. This is men's evolved preference for the hourglass figure in women. And by the way, there are also evolved preferences that women hold toward men. Uh, I'm just using one, one of the two examples. Both men and women have evolved sex-specific preferences in the mating market. So if I wanted to demonstrate that this preference is an adaptive one, how would I go about doing that? Let me try to get through this one quickly. Well, first, there's clearly theoretical data, uh, theoretical reasons why that would be the case, in the exact same way that endless sexually reproducing species evolve sex-specific preferences in their, op in their opposite uh, sex mates, that sexual selection, there's no reason to expect that humans are not under the purview of the exact same process. So certainly we are tight on theoretical grounds. Uh, we have medical data that shows that women who, ex who, who possess that figure uh, are more likely to be healthy typically are younger, are more likely to be new, are more likely to conceive. So that's a very direct currency from an evolutionary perspective. We could look at local and global online advertising data. How do female escorts advertise themselves when they're trying to advertise themselves to male patrons? And actually, that's, I did one of those studies. And it turns out that across 48 different countries that are profoundly different from each other, the average waist-to-hip ratio that is advertised is exactly what you would expect from an evolutionary perspective. Again, that's 48 countries. This is not 12 people in your undergraduate lab. We could look at cross-cultural and cross-temporal data from art f spanning from Egypt, Africa, Greek or Roman antiquity, India. We could look at, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that word, is it Joman? Joman? Figurines? 
and we can do a content analysis of the different statues, and they all, uh, you know, point to the same story. Psychological data, the preferences have been elicited, not just paper and pencil, but you could do brain imaging studies where you show that the pleasure center of men is more likely to uh, you know, be active or more active when they view uh, the evolutionary cues that they, they'd like to see, in this case, the hourglass figure. Uh, you, you could do other types of data, analysis of Playboy Center Fours and Miss America winners and show that the types of body types that they have is in line with what evolutionary theory predicts. And of course, that preference has been established across many, many different cultures. Okay. Albeit, there is a environmental uh, change that can happen. In some cultures where, for example, you have endemic famine, then I might prefer uh, a, you know, a heavier set, uh, precisely because, it's a, if you like, it's an adaptation uh, to the local environment. And then finally, this is the one that I like to discuss last. I only wish that I had been the one who did the study. This is a study that, was, uh, uh, that showed that congenitally blind men, so these are men who've never had the gift of sight, also have the preference for that waist-to-hip ratio. And, you, and the way that they elicit that preference is haptically through touch. And so it's difficult to argue that it's due to socialization, to Elle magazine, to Oprah, to Hollywood images, when they've never had the gift of sight. So when you put it all together, it certainly suggests that evolutionary psychologists, at least good ones, don't just come up with just so stories. They do the exact opposite to that. And that's why that particular criticism is the one that I find most galling. Yes, of course there is bad evolutionary psychology, but there's also bad physics. Physicists don't agree on whether string theory is correct or not. So it's normal that in a field, in a healthy field, we have disagreements. But to argue that evolutionary psychology is baloney is exactly the same quality of thinking as to say chemistry is baloney. Okay. So very, very briefly, I want to talk about a model that I had developed as part of my doctoral dissertation and then link it to what I'm saying here. This is a model of sequential choice. Uh, originally proposed by some German folks. Here's alternative A, here's alternative B. So you have a process whereby you go from many alternatives and you narrow it down to two. So say in the US presidential election, you have primaries where many Republicans go down to one, many Democrats go down to one, and then you finally have two alternatives, one Democrat, one Republican. So in many cases, we have this mechanism where we, we go from many alternatives down to two. So this model kicks in when you're down to two alternatives. And again, I'll link it in a second to evolution psychology. What this model basically says is that you try to pick up as many attributes as you can on the two alternatives until you either reach this stopping threshold or this stopping threshold. In other words, it's a race to see how much information do I need to acquire before I stop and choose the Mazda, before I stop and marry this person, before I stop and vote for this candidate. It's a stopping model. And so in this case, the first piece of information is in favor of alternative B, then the second one in favor of A, third one in favor of A, fourth one in favor of, and then it crosses a threshold. So after four pieces of information, I stop and choose alternative A. Well, I argue that this sequential model, which I originally had used in studying psychology of decision making, is exactly what you're doing when you're developing evolutionary arguments using nomological networks. You're collecting data until you reach a threshold that either is fully supportive of your adaptive argument or is refuting it, right? So it really is, if you like, a race to see whether in building that nomological network you've acquired enough evidence to be sufficiently convincing. Here what I'm talking about is the third of, in the original slide when I talked about consilient trees of knowledge. Evolutionary theory is, in, is incredibly powerful in really creating organized thinking. One of the problems in the social sciences is that from the get-go you could have profound disagreements. Does biology matter in explaining human behavior? Some people say absolutely, some people say absolutely not. Well, we're already at an impasse if at this fundamental level we can't agree. Well, what evolutionary psychology does is it offers us a way to organize our thinking. So you could start off with a bunch of general principles that have been tested in an infinite number of ways and validated in an infinite number of ways. These general principles lead to mid-level theories 
which lead to general principles, which then lead to specific hypotheses which you can test. And so here I gave four examples of studies that I've done that follow this path. And I could probably put all of my research that I've ever conducted with an evolutionary theory within this organized tree of knowledge. And the fact that I'm able to do that is precisely because there is this ability to create this consilience when you're thinking as an evolutionist. And so, of course, as I said, I apply it in consumer behavior, but it equally applies in endless other domains of human import. This is a long quote, but it, it's worth reading because it, it's just so powerful. So let me just read it, if you bear with me. Some academics talk about gaps in the literature as though the literature is a well-built wall with just the occasional gap that needs filling. Each study is, as Pink Floyd would say, another brick in the wall. The reality is that while we do seem to have an agreed standard as to what a brick is, there is no agreement as to which bricks need to be made first, no foundations, no architect of the final wall, and no ideas as to what the wall is expected to do when, if ever, it is built. It is as though we are constructing the Great Wall of China by agreeing that all of the bricks will be empirical studies that pass certain statistical tests, P less than 0.05. However, we do not agree on who built the wall, uh, on who will build each bit of the wall, nor do we agree on when or where we will build it. The consequence is that we have hundreds of well-meaning marketing scholars, but you could replace marketing scholar by fill-in-the-blank scholar, working very hard at making bricks. Each journal and each conference is just a jumble of bricks with the occasional group cemented together by a short-term research fad, fashion, or multi-researcher project. I won't read the rest, but it basically says that what allows you to, well, at least what I'm saying, what allows you to defeat or address this sad state of affairs is an organizing theoretical framework. So in biology, not everybody is an evolutionary biologist, but everybody understands that there is no other game in town other than evolution. You could be a cellular biologist, a molecular biologist, and an or, or, uh, a biologist at the organ, organism level, population ecologist. Uh, you could be all of those different types of biologists, but you all agree that evolution certainly is the mechanism that created biodiversity. We need to have the same thing in the behavioral sciences, and certainly in the business schools. Uh, I always tell my students in this building that they can study uh, personnel psychology, trading behavior, economic behavior, consumer behavior, entrepreneurship, without ever mentioning the word biology once. I mean, that's extraordinary. Every single other species that a scientist studies, the first thing you would do as a zoologist, as an ethologist, you would study the biology of that behavior. But somehow, humans in general, and certainly managers and employees and consumers exist in a world outside their biology. That can't make sense. Another thing that, how am I doing, am I okay on time? Yeah. How am I, uh, another thing that evolutionary psychology does is it provides us with methodological pluralism. What do I mean by that? Most doctoral students are typically trained within a paradigm. I am a priming person. All my research is done by experiments, two by two, design. and So the world now becomes only viewed through the prism of whatever methodology I was trained in. But I do think that if you're an evolutionist, I mean, that doesn't mean that you won't succumb to this type of meth methodological myopia, but you're less likely to, precisely because you have sort of this broader epistemological uh, lens from which to work. And so in my case, I've done research across every possible methodological tradition that you could think of. Why? Because I'm really driven by exciting problems. I'm not tied to a methodology. If someone in this room approaches me and says, hey, do you want to do a study on this psychiatric disorder? I don't care whether I'm in the business school or not. Convince me that it's something that is worth investigating, and let's go and have fun and try to explore it. And so that's one of the things that I try to impart to my students who are interested in studying consumer behavior. Interdisciplinarity, almost every single university you could think of says that it is their mission to promote interdisciplinarity. Well, as much as I love Concordia and they've been nothing but wonderful in allowing me to pursue all my research and teaching interests completely unencumbered, uh, they're not as interdisciplinary as you'd like them to think they are. Uh, I tried to set up an evolutionary studies program at Concordia to mimic that which had been started by David Sloan Wilson at Binghamton University, 
Well, what do you think happens? Everybody becomes very territorial over their disciplines. So from this side of the mouth, we say we all want to be interdisciplinary, but then from that side of the mouth, we commit the ethological territorial defense. Don't encroach on my territory. I don't want to speak to you, you're from another discipline. Well, evolutionary psychology, here are some of the fields. If you go to the Human Behavior and Evolution Society, and right here we have Doug Kenrick, who is uh, the current president of HBES, correct? Uh, right? Uh, very, very prestigious society. Uh, I, I looked, this is from a few years ago, I looked at the people who attend HBES and the affiliations, like which departmental affiliations they come from, they span everything. What they have in common is that they're all interested in applying the evolutionary lens to their particular areas of interest. On the other hand, if you look at the premier scientific association in consumer psychology and consumer research, they're almost exclusively from marketing. Why is that? Every, I mean, there's endless possible folks who should be interested in our consumatory nature, and yet it's almost exclusively people housed in marketing departments, and yet we say that we are an interdisciplinary bunch. We're not. I did a study with several other folks in 2011 where we actually empirically tested uh, this idea. We took uh, departmental affiliations of people who publish in non-evolutionary psychology journals versus evolutionary psychology journals, and again, much greater representation of fields when you are publishing in EP journals and evolutionary psychology journals. The weird bias is a term that was introduced by Joe Henrik, who is now at Harvard, and uh, he published a paper in Behavioral and Brain Sciences a few years ago, a brilliant paper, you should all read it. A weird, ref I, I always forget the Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. The idea is that much of our knowledge typically comes from samples, at least in the behavioral sciences, comes from samples that come from weird societies. Right? And so the idea is, does evolutionary psychology promote a greater likelihood of succumbing to the weird bias or a lesser likelihood? Well, a much lesser likelihood. Precisely because, for example, if you want to study human universals, you actually have to go and test it in, as I did in 48 countries. And so here is an actual study that was done by Robert Kurtzman. It was, I think it was only published on his blog uh, several years ago, where you simply look at, so JPSP, Journal of Personality Social Psychology, is a sort of non-EP journal, an evolution and human behavior, which Marty Hazelton was the editor-in-chief of for several years, is a evolutionary journal. And this is the, this is the percentage of studies, of papers, that are exclusively from weird samples. All you need to know, basically, is that by being an evolutionist, you're much more likely to get out of you know, your undergraduate student's lab. You're much more likely to go to a hunter-gatherer society and to a society in the Amazon if you want to test universals. So what are some of the key benefits that uh, incorporating evolutionary theory to, well, to consumer research, but really to, to anything, it offers you more complete explanations because epistemologically you're tackling problems at the proximate and at the ultimate level. It allows you to generate novel hypotheses and research questions that would have otherwise been invisible to you. So in the same way that there are things that you can't study at the nano level if you don't have an electronic microscope, there are questions that you wouldn't even have thought of asking where you're not coming from an evolutionary lens. It allows you to reject hypotheses a priori if they seem inconsistent with basic evolutionary principles. This is called the Savannah Principle. There are some things that we don't even need to bother testing because we know a priori they are so fundamentally in violation of basic evolutionary principles that we, we, we don't need to waste taxpayer money. We know that they're going to be outright wrong. It offers, as I said, greater consilience, greater methodological pluralism, greater interdisciplinary, it promotes an ethos of conceptual replications. We, we often hear now about the replication crisis in science in general, but certainly in the behavioral sciences. Well, when you're building these nomological networks, it, it, that promotes conceptual replications. You are replicating a key finding using many, many different methodologies and paradigms. And then finally, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there is less reliance on weird samples. Just very, very quickly, I, I always love to use this quote. Uh, this is the quote that I would use if I ever 
uh, were to write an autobiography of my scientific career, I wouldn't need to say anything more than this quote. It was already written for me by J.B.S. Haldane, who basically argued that when scientists are exposed to a new, quote, radical idea, they go through four stages of acceptance. At first, when they're exposed to it, this is worthless nonsense. Then as more evidence comes in, well, this might be interesting, but it's a perverse point of view. As more evidence comes in, well, sure, it's true, but I mean, who cares? This is BS. It's, it's unimportant. And then finally, when the tsunami of the nomological networks hits you in the face, oh, I always said so. I've always loved your work, Professor Saad. So the same person who 15 years ago had written me an email to say that this whole biology thing is a bunch of garbage, 15 years later, invites me to their university and say, it would be an honor to have you lecture for us. Uh, some very shameless plugging. If you're interested in the evolutionary basis of our consumer behavior, it's here. In this book, what I do is I open up the evolutionary lens across the business school to demonstrate how you could apply it in retailing and behavioral economics. And, and so I looked for uh, authors, for scholars that are working at the intersection of EP and various business disciplines. And I'll end with this quote. Dobzhansky famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And hopefully, if you walk away from today's symposium with the following final conclusion, nothing in consumer behavior or in business in general makes sense except in the light of evolution. Thank you very much. Okay. J just short of 30 minutes, that's good. Uh, open it up to questions. You can come up to the microphone only because we'd like to have, it, have your voice in the taping of the events. If you have any questions, you can do so now. Yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Said, thank you, you for putting this on. Um, your treatment of consilience inspired me to write a piece on it in April. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Is there a concerted resistance against uh, adopting consilience in pedagogy? And if not, how can we, uh, how can we promote it to, uh, to get towards a more mature discourse? Specifically in a pedagogic context? or I think there's a difficulty of, in people of thinking in a consilient way. I think it really does come from the fact that we, we train people to be very siloed. So even, even look at the, in the business school. Uh, there is finance and there is marketing and there is organizational behavior. We're on different floors. We, you, could, you could put in a police lineup the professors in the other department. I wouldn't be able to, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but uh, you know, it'd be difficult for me to identify who they are. It's just, regrettably, it's part of the ethos of academia. To, I mean, in part, it's understandable because you do have to create a deep expertise in an area for you to contribute to it. Uh, but unfortunately, that could be taken, that, that pension could become sort of hyperactive, where people become ever more specialized in a very minuscule plus epsilon. That's the territoriality. That's the territoriality. And so what I, it, maybe it's just my, the unique combination of my genes that led to who I am. Uh, I am someone who likes to just explore many intellectual landscapes. I don't want to go to the same vacation spot every year. I'd like to go to different islands. By the same token, I'd like to visit many different. What, what, what unites my interest is always the evolutionary you know, lens, but I could apply it in psychiatry. I could apply it in medicine. I could apply it in, of course, consumer behavior. I don't care where it goes as long as it titillates my intellectual curiosity. And so I think what we need to do is sort of teach our students who then become the next generation of professors to, yes, of course, be committed to be an expert in a narrow field, but to always maintain sort of a broad lens of interest. It's not always easy to walk that fine line, but at least if I've done a good job, maybe my students will tell me if I have or not, but that, I think that's the only way to do it. So it should be done extra institutionally? Uh, well, so outside, outside of the university, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, only to the extent that universities have a lot of cultural inertia, it's often difficult to make the change from within. But I'd like to think that eventually we'll be able to make those changes. Uh, sometimes, by the way, I know of professors 
very famous professors who've left academia set up their own institutes precisely because they felt that the inertia in the university did not allow out-of-the-box thinking. And that's regrettable. The university should be the place where we do allow out-of-the-box thinking. Thank you so much. Cheers. Hi, Jeffrey Miller. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> no, this is all good. I'm just curious why you think there, there may be different responses to evolutionary psychology insights as a function of whether you're a professor in a marketing department in a B school versus a professional market researcher oh, or account executive in an ad agency who's actually working to sell stuff oh. versus maybe like a small business owner where all you care about is effectiveness and you're not even necessarily in a corporate structure that has certain ideological assumptions. Yeah, that's a fantastic question because that's actually been the reality that I've experienced in my career. Uh, I always uh, remark exactly what uh, Jeffrey said, that when, when I go and give a lecture to academics, it's very different than when I give a lecture in industry. In industry, people are not vested in a paradigm. They're only interested in what works. So if I go up there and I say, you know, here are some reasons why using these advertising cues will increase the effectiveness of your advertising campaign, people go, yeah, great. When you give the roughly the same lecture couched more scientifically to academics, boo, Nazi, Nazi, how dare you, biology, garbage, right? Well, because they're vested. They've spent 20, 30, 40 years vested in a paradigm that oftentimes they wrongly think is antithetical, is contrary to biological thinking. One of the things that I had to learn in crafting my message to hostile crowds, which, by the way, it's a, it's a marketing job. How do you market ideas, right? We don't just market Coca-Cola and, and uh, Starbucks. We market ideas. So everything is marketing. Well, I had to learn what are the reasons why there are certain obstacles coming from social scientists. Well, even the words ultimate versus proximate that I used earlier, it became clear to me that some people misunderstood ultimate to be superior. It's the ultimate. It's the better. And so here comes biology boy with his brick of truth telling us the ultimate reason. And so I had to soften that message. But the bottom line is... It's either whether you have a vested interest or all you care about is what works. Practitioners don't give a damn about ideology. It works, I'm in. Anything else? Yes, sir. A professor of psychology from here at Concordia. Hi, Andrew. Hi, how are you doing? Good, yourself? <clears throat> okay, so by incredible coincidence, over the summer, you sent me a copy of the paper that this is based yeah, on. Yes, sir. I was sitting in a coffee shop and I saw a friend who asked me what I was reading about. And I was at the part where you actually showed the figure here, where there's the, um, to do with the child preferences, and there's the cross-cultural data, and there's all this other stuff, right? And they had that look, the sort of the, the eyes open like songsters. I thought they were having the epiphany, and they had a kind of epiphany, but the response was, wow, it's amazing how deep the patriarchy goes. <laughs> and... Right? And I was like, oh, what do you mean, right? And they really, because I, I do cultural psychology stuff, they focused on that. They're like, well, look at the 40, 50 different countries. This pervasive influence of British American colonialism has led all of these countries to end up being shaped the same way. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So then I thought about your, what you were saying today about, you know, you're having a discussion with somebody, and I make an argument that's worth plus 0.3 and it pops up a bit, but they make an argument that's worth minus 0.2 and it goes down a bit. And we go back and forth and eventually we cross the threshold. But what if we weight the arguments we're making very differently, right? So I'm giving plus 0.9 because of the cross-cultural evidence and they're giving negative 0.6 because of the same cross-cultural evidence. So what do, what do I think what, of that? What do we do? Well, I guess I... I'm curious what we do about that, but I also wonder if one of the, f the problems potentially with your model of how we reach decisions is it's based on the idea that we'd all weight the evidence the same way. We're just right. waiting for it to come in. Our job is to marshal it, but we'd all agree on that, Got it. On that pattern. I mean, I think that you're right that the model looks at the, the, 
the impact of the information, which is in part captured by its weight. I'd like to think that when you're building a strong nomological network of cumulative evidence, that irrespective of how you weigh the information in each of those boxes, so you weigh it at point three, I weigh it at point seven, yeah. the tsunami that I'm gonna hit you with, once you finish going through the entire network, will put you over the stopping threshold. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, it, so the weighing will simply slow down the inevit inevitable, which is we're gonna hit it. So if, I, if I'm doing a good job yeah. at building the adaptive argument, I don't care how you weigh it. The, but here's, I'm gonna give you worse news than what you said. The reality is that some people, you could give them an infinite nomological network of humorous evidence and they're gonna go, la la la, I can't hear you. Now that falls into sort of just zealotry, ideological zealotry. There's no way I could offer you any amount of evidence that will convince you otherwise. That, that's how religious folks think, right? There's no way for me to build you a nomological network that moves you away from your you know, religious beliefs. And for those folks, unfortunately, I don't think this model will work. But for people who are sort of more fair-minded, that are open to sort of coming to the table and letting the evidence fall where it may, then I think you can target them. So if I, just to follow up. Sure. So, yeah, and I've had experiences of arguing with people who are arguing in bad faith. In this case, I think it was a discussion in good faith. So maybe the positive piece from my anecdote would be something like, oh, that's an interesting point about Western influence on different countries. Maybe we need to follow up by selecting societies that right. have a lesser influence or using more historical data. Which incidentally, which is what the pneumological network does do that. Right, exactly. OOC to, that did that with a million other cultures that are completely removed from Western patriarchal blah, blah, right. blah. And like you say, if they're arguing in bad faith, then... It's, it's over, there's no way to do. get to them. Okay, thanks. Did you have a question? But there's a study by Charles Lord that suggests that it's not just religious fanatics that reject. He looked at undergraduates at Stanford University. They're going to be about as select as you could possibly get, to, you know, to be smart. Um, <clears throat> Jeffrey will testify to that, that, uh, you know, these kids are highly select, if nothing else. And uh, they were presented with evidence on both sides of capital punishment. Yeah, and it was a strong body of evidence, you know, many studies against, not, or many arguments in favor, many arguments against. If you had an extreme position, you should have, if you were a smart person, moved towards the center. What happened is the kids, Stanford students, looking carefully at, at powerful evidence that most of them had never read much about, and it was, they made the evidence up, of course, so it was balanced on both sides. The ones who were pro became more pro, the ones who were con became more con. So it's not that easy of a job. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just add a quick anecdote to what Doug just said, and then I'll wrap it up. I think we have to move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, I think it was my former doctoral supervisor who told me the following anecdote. He had been c uh, contracted as a consultant to help a company decide whether they should go ahead with the product or not. And some of the executives wanted to go ahead with it, some of it they didn't want to go ahead with it. So they decided to hold a focus group with some relevant group to, to sort of break the tie. And they sat behind the one-way mirror. And at the end of the conversation, the ones who were in the yay group said, aha, you see, we were right. And the ones who were in the nay group said, aha, you see, we were right. So both of them looked at the exact same interaction and came to the exact opposite conclusion. Well, how did they do that? Through selective processing, right? Through the confirmation bias. All right, guys, my time is up. Thank you very much.